So that was kind of funny. Um, me, uh, a break in continuity for me to put these gloves on so I look a bit more like uh, Albert Steptoe. It's getting a bit cold here. Uh, I was rudely interrupted there because uh, we were just about to have a gas explosion. The uh, gas cylinder outside was leaking. We just had the gas man around for uh, an hour or so, I don't know how long. Um, I just played back that last bit of video and I've obviously I've got uh, QAnon, the conspiracy theory, mixed up with Al-Anon, which is the support organisation for alcoholics. That's not funny, right? Where was I? Where was I? Viral shedding, 1983. Um, we told you all this stuff was going to happen back then. Um, yeah. Back then, um, nobody, the term viral shedding was quite unusual. Uh, John Peel played this record, I think because uh, <laughs> The reason it got played was because uh, Illuminated had a plugger who who would go around to Peel's studio. It didn't really uh, pick up on the rest of our work, as far as I'm aware. People say, "Oh yeah, John Peel used to play that." I think it's just like the one time that uh, that this got played. Really, I don't think it was picked up on at all. What's next? Oh, viral shedding. Uh, all these all these recordings come and come out under uh, in different guises and uh, what's this oh yeah the uh, there was a remix of no separation that uh, the guys from 400 blows did uh, that was Tony Thorpe and uh, did the remix on that Tony Thorpe uh, talking of the Illuminati and talking of uh, this conspiracy theory uh, he did the, the remix for uh, uh, the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo number one hit single. So there's more of this conspiracy theory to this blah, 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 than meets the eye. Nocturnal Emissions. This is, uh, this is kind of a, perhaps a break in continuity. The world is my womb. I think we did it in 87. Yeah, we did. And so I was, rec this was in 87. And I was down here in Par Bay in Cornwall, uh, July 86, the year before. So that was the first time I came down to, to Par Beach then, which is where uh, I go to walk the dog about once a week. Uh, so that's interesting, isn't it? That's the first time I was down on that beach. I was actually recording on that beach and then all these years later, I'm down there walking the dog. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's funny. Oh yeah, we kept, when we came down here, I came, uh, uh, I was doing uh, some binaural recording of um, of sea sounds because um, I was doing this, uh, I was doing all this sort of weirdy, weirdy uh, new age millennialist stuff. Um, Going through this sort of getting myself brainwashed within these sort of um, very culty, new agey, ther therapeutic, uh, in this very, you know, expensive uh, afternoons, weekends locked in a hotel with uh, neurotic rich people. I was doing a bit of that. Yeah, uh, so I mean, they reached a point where I had. Uh, more money than sense and then uh, quite soon i had more sense than i had more sense than I had money so this is the world is my womb which was like i say it was when he first came came down to to cornwall and i met up with uh, um there was a guitarist who, who I stayed with and uh, he actually uh took me around to meet uh, pat skinner back then who uh, who helped who years later helped me out with uh, doing some of the Nocturnal Emissions videos for, for live shows. 
uh, Pat's no longer with us. Alas. Um, the world is my womb. Oh, I mean, this is a, a very unusual record. And I think I spoke about this yesterday. So uh, let's rewind. Spirit flesh. This huge magnified nipple type thing is uh, actually what's called uh, Peter's Stone in Derbyshire. It's near Wardle Myers in Derbyshire. And uh, we used to go camping there when we, when we were teenagers. Uh, me and my mates and uh, it was a case of uh, some of my mates would steal pills from their their parents and uh, that sort of thing. We still camping down here anyway. So uh, yeah, Spirit Flesh is the purest and most refined record from the Nocturnal Emissions. The rituals we have used in the, in the creation of these recordings are designed to empower and energise through transmutation. And here in these sleeve notes, I've used this sort of uh, odd capitalization, which is uh, used in these uh, by these visionaries. You know, they have this uh, odd punctuation, and uh, recording itself is a distillation of mantra voices of the animal and bird kingdoms. Well, it's got bird song on it, like you can hear outside. Uh, natural harmonics and resonances fused into the immediate human evangelic spectrum through the application of tra traditional religious instruments, instruments of more recent high-tech wonder. Touch of the old uh, TC left bridges going on here, uh, picking up on uh, the vibes from location and, and, and field recording, applying um, ideas of high-tech to uh, ghost busting let's say i don't know uh this particular place is known as peter stone officially peter meaning stone and stone meaning stone so it's a place called stone stone uh there's a very good pub nearby called in wardler the three stags it's got all uh the last time was, I've not been there for years but the last time I went in there all the chairs are, are like different inside that pub and they used to have this mummified cat that had been found in a cave or something it, it the, the limestone had sort of dripped down onto this cat and it solidified it whoa spooky ah and I've got tracks here that uh, about all these places I used to go camping really when I was a uh, an early teenager, uh, Thor's Cave, there's a track called Thor's Cave. Thor's Cave, I don't know if you've seen this uh, Ken Russell film, The Lair of the White Worm, which was based on a, a, a Bram Stoker book. It's got, um, oh, I want to say Charlotte Rampling in it because I've already said Al Anon and got that muddled up with uh, Q Anon. Uh, it's got uh, that bloke out of four weddings and a funeral in it and uh, it's, it's a really good film uh, Lair of the White Worm Ken Russell Ken Russell was a great filmmaker um, it's uh, you know it's a sort of a horror film it's a bit like those 70s Hammer horror films but done I think they used a bit of computer computery stuff I've not seen it for ages actually it's a uh, yeah, so that was that was filmed um, in this location, which was uh, I was very familiar with from when I was a, a, a teenager. Another film that was uh, I saw being made in in the vicinity when I were doing this was uh, The Living Dead in the Manchester Morgue, which was uh, a band video nasty. A few years later, which was uh, I mean we used to go to sort of various little youth clubs in the vicinity. Are we on? Yeah, what I was uh, talking about there was uh, Lair of the White Worm and uh, Living Dead at the Manchester Morgue. And uh, what else was there? These Peak District locations that were used in uh, in horror films. 
Uh, one was a zombie film, the other one was a really good one about all this traditional stuff that was going on. It's, uh, you know, like The Wicker Man's one of these sort of folk horror sort of films. Um, Lair of the White Worm's a good one anyway. And Thor's Cave, they uh, they found some of the the oldest evidence of humans living in this country in Thor's Cave. And there's all these animals which are all now extinct are in there. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's funny, like, uh, I've got, there's this overlay in memory from films I've seen and uh, places that I've lived in. And uh, I think uh, it's getting to the state, you're getting this precognition of, of places and vibes about places before you ever get there be because uh, it's not just the spirit of the place, it's sort of this media projection of, of place. Yeah, interesting stuff, uh, the Peak District. Uh, there's a history of uh, trespass there as well, um, which is to do with access to open spaces uh, dating back, I was in the 30s, I mean, uh, working people from um, the, the surrounding cities just, just wanted to get out and go for walks and stuff. And uh, these... Uh, landowners the duke of Dev devonshire set their gamekeepers onto them and it's, it's quite violent and uh, it sort of continues like that because uh, all these i don't know hunting shooting fishing uh inbred fools claim ownership of the open spaces a Duke of Devonshire's family was, uh, he was married to one of the, the Mitfords, I, believe. I don't know if it's the same Duke of Devonshire, he was married to one of the, the Mitfords and one of the Mitfords was a, a friend of Hitler's and another one was a communist. So they're a funny old uh, posh family, a very, you know, very, uh, very posh family. Spirit flesh. So yeah, on this I was, I was playing the harmonium I've got the harmonium here and it's it needs uh it needs to go to repair shop <laughs> and it, because uh the spring the springs are rusty and the keys stick um great thing about this harmonium is uh it's um it's uh at the moment it's a semitone flat and not only that it's um suffered from damp and um, changes environmental changes it's probably about 100 years old and it's in need of uh, some care and attention from the repair shop and i think i need to get a hold of uh, <laughs> there's this tv sh show where they they fix things <laughs> and uh, they manage to do things so perfectly they never mess up at all they never lose you know things never go oh, say, oh, it's really, oh how's this expect expecting that it, it suddenly go ping but it never goes ping and everything's always repaired on it which is uh, absolutely nothing like real life <laughs> and uh, they cut bits out all the crucial bits you think well how the hell do they do that they edit it out just like i'm doing this video you'll, you'll be thinking how does he do that how does he do that well ah uh, that happens off camera yeah uh yeah church harmonium chimes music box car wipers i've got these car wipers uh, it's squeaky windscreen wipers and, and it sounds like um didgeridoos and uh chimpanzees african and european wildfowl well i wasn't such a a huge expert on what bird made which sound back then <laughs> yeah so I'm, I'm sort of um, trying to educate myself on these bits that i missed out bits of my education where i missed out birds are the descendants of dinosaurs and they're very similar to dinosaurs so I mean, one of the things I was thinking in, in, in the music and what, what I've used is I've used sampled bird song 
and I've pitched it down because I'm thinking, well, a dinosaur would be like a big bird and uh, they'd sort of, they'd have the territory. And so these pitch down sounds of birds these days might approximate the vocalizations of um, Jurassic Park more accurately than the roars that they have on uh, Jurassic Park. Yeah, bird song. Blackbird singing as we speak. You might be able to hear a busy road there. I live in Cornwall. Uh, this is supposed to be lockdown in Cornwall. But uh, the road's going to get very busy over these next few weeks because uh, nobody's allowed to leave the country. So uh, they're all coming down here. Uh, right, chimpanzees. Sample voices of chimpanzees. I um, This was in London Zoo. I, I went along... Uh, with my recording equip my my recording walkman my trusty recording walkman i don't know if i took the binaural headphones to that i used a, a binaural recording when i did uh will this my womb i borrowed this larry peterson lent me his binaural headphones and uh, i'd stand in the sea with these headphones on and we did the first uh the first experiments were in Kent, but there was this um, constant sound of sailboards and motorboats and stuff. So uh, tried it again a few weekends later and spent a few days in Cornwall and uh, recorded um, some of the um, wave sounds late at night on these beaches. Uh, yeah. Thor's Cave, Peter Stone, Bone Shaker, Rain Dance, Chimpanzees. Yeah, I was working at London Zoo for a while. When I first moved into London in uh, 1979, I, I worked in the London Zoo shop for a while. And um, there was this sign outside the chimpanzee enclosure. It said, uh, chimpanzees are very intelligent animals. You know, they, they've got these very... Uh, you know, they're very socialised and they've got a language and, and they, they speak in sign language and all, all, they've got all this complicated behaviour. And I thought, well, why the hell have you got them in a glass box then? You know, um, this sort of thing uh, bothers me. Yeah, I got this job in, in the zoo. I don't know if you ever, if you're of my generation, you might remember Johnny Morris. It was just like this zookeeper he play, he, on the kids' programme. He was a zookeeper in London Zoo. And the, the job that I put in for was actually as the guy, that, the job that uh, Johnny Morris had, which was uh, cleaning uh, cleaning out the cages, or, you know, shoveling lion shit. Because <laughs> I thought, wow, I want to be close to the animals. But uh, actually, I just worked in the shop for a couple of weeks. Uh, it was nice because... Uh, nice because um, we've got some eagle feathers from there these eagles you didn't know, very very far to fly around and again to my mate span who's into red indians back in the peak district who taught me a lot of uh, stuff about uh, native american culture a long time ago 